Before we get started with today's show, I wanted to tell you about another great ESPN podcast, The Low Post. The latest episodes are a redraft of the 2009 NBA draft with Bill Simmons and a discussion of all the details of the NBA's bubble in Orlando with Kevin Arnovitz. Be sure to check it out. You can download and subscribe to The Low Post now as well as The Right Time wherever you get your podcast. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to The Right Time. My name is Bomani Jones. Thanks for listening wherever you get your podcast. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. Uh, coming up on this episode, we're going to talk to Josh Levine of Slate. It's a new season of the Slow Burn Podcast. We're going to talk to him about what's going on with that. Also, you know, the NBA bubble, which sounds kind of hilarious. But first... <laughs> All right, guys, I am here to briefly advise that you not fall for the okie doke. And that's no shade to anybody because I feel like people have kind of fallen for the okie doke. But I saw it all over the television yesterday. I believe you saw it also where people were like, hey, man, the Chargers, they talk about bringing in Colin Kaepernick for a workout. Woo! And people got all excited. Now, I want to start with number one. At this point, the idea of bringing Kaepernick in for a workout don't mean a damn thing because didn't Seattle basically do the same thing a couple years ago? All this, what I might do, what I'm finna do, everything else, none of that matters until somebody actually signs the dude. Like, you're just not getting me charged up about this. But this is how low our standard is at this point. Anthony Lynn was talking to reporters, and this is what he said about the idea of Kaepernick playing for the Chargers. He said, it would be crazy to not have him on your workout list. All right, further, he says, I haven't spoken with Colin. Not sure where he's at as far in his career, what he wants to do but Colin definitely fits the style of quarterback for the system that we're going to be running. I'm very confident and happy with the three quarterbacks that I have, but you can never have too many people waiting on the runway. Waiting on the runway, right? This dude is saying, basically, if something happens to Easton Stick, maybe we'll give Colin Kaepernick a call. Easton Stick, we'll give him a call. Chargers have Tyrod Taylor right now as the starter. Justin Herbert, first round pick is the next guy, and then we get to our man Easton Stick. No shade to Easton Stick. All I'm saying is, if the coach is saying, if something happens to Easton Stick, we might give Colin Kaepernick a call, that tells me that we're kind of sort of far away. You know what I mean? Like, maybe I'm wrong. But that's what it tells me right then and there. Dude, they not gonna do it. Have you seen anything from any owner to indicate that there's any level of bend coming? on this right like have you seen that cats ain't gonna budge right and here's something that i think is important if we're talking about the owners and the fact that they're not gonna budge or my belief that they're not gonna budge it's important to know why because when this was all going on in like 2017 when it was really cracking on keeping kaepernick out of the league there were two things that people talked about number one was the idea that this would be grossly offensive to fans right that's their big thing i still haven't seen any evidence of it But number two was nobody wanted to draw the ire of the president. Okay? Like, that was a huge part of it. And look, if you worked in media or any place that was forward-facing and you had a Twitter account, the one thing that you learned in 2017, 2018, the thing that scared your bosses as much, if not more than anything else, was the idea that President Trump will tweet about you and now everybody's day is ruined. Now everybody's thing is messed up. Your money going to get messed up. Stock prices going to fall. All of this stuff on the basis of Donald Trump sending a tweet. People don't seem to be as worried or as shook about Trump sending a tweet at this point. He don't scare people now the way that he used to scare people. That's worth noting. But on top of that, listen to what Donald Trump had to say on Wednesday when he was asked about the idea of Colin Kaepernick kneeling. Like, I want to be clear about this. He was asked about kneeling. Let's go. When it comes to sports and kneeling do you think colin kaepernick should get another shot in the nfl if he deserves it he should if he has the playing ability he was he started off great and then he didn't end up very great in terms of as a player he he was terrific in his rookie year i think he was very good in his second year and then something happened so uh his playing wasn't up to snuff the answer is absolutely i would as far as kneeling i would love to see him get another shot but obviously he has to be able to play well if he can't play well i think it would be very unfair okay guys let's stop and think about what happened there like 
Donald Trump says that he thinks that Kyle Kaepernick should have another chance in the league if he could play. He was asked about kneeling, whether he should come back. And don't forget, guys, Trump is the guy that said that we need to throw all them sons of b- out of the league. You remember that? Right? Like, wasn't that his thing? That we need to throw all the sons of b- out of the league just because they were kneeling. Do you notice that he's backed off that rhetoric? Think about this for a second. Donald Trump isn't even banging the drum of how disrespectful kneeling is anymore. He's not doing that, okay? So the owner's argument behind this, as it's been given to us, has been, hey, man, we don't want to offend Trump, and we don't want to offend our fans, right? Right? Like that's the, that, those are the white people that they don't want to make mad, and that's why they don't want to get down with this. Okay, cool. Trump doesn't seem to be bothered, and the whole public discussion around all these matters seems to have changed, and you're still not hearing about anybody wanting to bring Colin Kaepernick on. What that requires from us as media, if any of you guys ever get a chance to actually ask an owner a question, right? If you're not afraid of the backlash, or if the backlash is not what you thought it was going to be, if we have all these people giving clear indications that the backlash ain't really something that you got to worry about, then why aren't you doing it? We've stripped out all the nonsense, right? We've stripped out all the noise. We have whittled away everything that's around the core issues that are here. And now you can ask yourself, so why doesn't Colin Kaepernick have a job? And why won't somebody seem to give him a job? And for how many of the owners is the reality that I don't like what he had to say? Like, that's it. Not about money, right? Not about PR. How many of them just didn't like what he had to say, you know? And hey, I do think that some of them might be afraid of their fans. For example, Shad Khan in Jacksonville, right? Don't exactly know how that goes over. And this is worth noting. And I'll put this out here. This is something that uh Whitlock reported like 15 years ago or somewhere in there, right? Give him the credit because he's the one who said it. You remember when Byron Leftwich and David Garrard were with the Jaguars? Their whole depth chart was black dudes at quarterback. They had three black dudes at quarterback. Also had a black general manager who was a pioneering quarterback, it's worth noting. But anyway, the reason that we're like a report that they did that was so that the fans wouldn't stay screaming for the white dude that was on the bench. That the only chance that the black quarterback had in that place was if there was another black quarterback behind him. Otherwise, the noise would be too loud. Right. So that's separate from Kaepernick as a political issue and just a recognition of how that team seems to think its city is going to react on these matters. But if the issue is simply that these owners didn't like what he said, who the snowflakes now? You know, for everybody who gets caught up in that logic and all those discussions and everything else, who the snowflake now? If that's the reason why the dude's not in the league or at least getting a chance. Because I think there is some measure of legitimacy to the argument that Kaepernick hasn't played in years. However, It's a lot of dudes in the NFL who ain't played in years. Like quarterbacks, a lot of dudes. Think about somebody gave Chase Daniel like $7 million when he hadn't thrown basically any passes in the NFL, right? Because they just thought he would be such a great option as a backup. Chad Henney, who backs up Patrick Mahomes, I don't, he ain't really been throwing no whole lot of passes in the last 10 years or anything like that, right? He hadn't been there. Go around, go find these guys. It's lots of dudes in the NFL who ain't throwing a pass anytime recently. A lot of them. That don't sound like the hold up to me. They out here, remember they got Josh McCown while he was uh, coaching somewhere? I'm trying to remember what quarterback it was recently who hadn't played in forever who said that somebody came and hollered at him and asked him if he'd be willing to come back and play football. Nah, man. These owners apparently didn't like what he had to say or they didn't like the fact that he did it without permission. Either way it goes, every argument that they had, football or otherwise, as to why you can't sign Kaepernick has gone out the window. All we're left with is whatever the reason is that you won't sign Kaepernick. And you'll never get any of them to say it out loud because that's when they start telling on themselves. All right, man, the NBA going to try to have these games in this bubble. By the way, can I talk to some of y'all that seem to think that I'm some variety of sellout because I ain't trying to listen to Kyrie Irving? 
First of all, what I think is happening here is I don't think that people are actually listening to what I say about why I'm not listening to Kyrie on this. And they assume that my logic is the same as Stephen A. Smith's or anybody else's that they decided they don't like what those people had to say about this thing with Kyrie. My thing is, number one, if it is unsafe to play and these dudes deem it to be unsafe to play, that they should not play. I disagree with the idea that coming back to play basketball will suddenly take all this attention away from the protest, right? And you want to know a reason I disagree with it now that I did not say before? It's pretty simple. Y'all ain't paying as much attention to the protest now as you were two weeks ago, and there ain't no NBA. Like, don't blame the basketball for that, right? If you want to pay attention and give that your energy, then you can do that. You can do it and watch basketball games on the same night, whatever it is. It can be done, but the level of interest that people are going to have in what's going on in the streets, I don't think the presence of basketball is going to affect that. Like if I thought that Kyrie was right and that coming back to play basketball would truly take away from what's going on outside, then I would be right behind him. I just don't think that's correct. Like if he was correct, I'd be like, yeah, man, make the decision. Y'all going to lose some money. And by the way, the money part matters. Like a whole lot of y'all out here acting like, man, money don't matter. The whole economic structure of the league is at stake with this. Like I'm not being dramatic. I'm not making that up. That's what it is. So these things have to be very seriously considered. But I'm not just simply like, yo, go get this money for the man. No, I'm saying that you might want to consider the economic system as it plays. But more than that, I just don't think that what he's saying adds up. And, you know, people on the, hey, man, you're just blaming the messenger. You're damn right. I got a problem with the messenger. The messenger doesn't have a credibility. And that's fair for me to say. I would not follow that dude into this, right? So I just want to throw that out there. But anyway, we're finding out about what's going to happen with this bubble. And my first point was, if it's not safe, I don't blame anybody for not going. And Gabe, this all sounds wild unsafe. Like, they sound like they are trying to thread a needle on such a spectacular level. I put it like this. This is one of two things that jumped out. I'm going to say the one thing that jumped out to me out of all the proposals, and I'm going to ask you what jumped out to you because I better know what you're going to say jumped out to you. They say they're going to have ping pong tables in the hotel because they got to find things for all these cats to do. So they're going to have all the decks of cards, right? But you can only use a deck of cards once, and then you got to throw it out, you know, because you don't want to catch it or anything. And I imagine there will be copious sums of money on the table. I would love to see some of these Instagram stories of these cats while they're on lockdown in these fancy hotels. But Gabe, they say they're going to have ping pong tables and you can play singles ping pong, but not doubles. Yeah, you can play basketball with someone and touch the same basketball, but yes. don't stand next to them. Can I ask you this other question? Do you know anybody that plays doubles ping pong that's not a professional? That sounds like something that like kids do in high school. Yes. The only way to get everybody to participate is to play doubles just because it's a numbers game. Yes. I don't know anybody who owns four paddles. Hell, the boys club got two paddles per table. And one of those paddles is actually a good paddle. That is correct. Yes. But there nobody's equipped for doubles ping pong. But anyway, yeah, you can play singles, but you cannot play doubles. I just found that to be hilarious. Was there anything else that jumped out about the bubble proposal? Well, what I originally thought was that guests were not going to be allowed on the Worldwide Sports campus, but that's actually not true. Guests are going to be allowed onto campus after the first round of the playoffs is completed to be allowed onto campus, guests will have to self quarantine for a week, then quarantine and be tested at least every other day for three days in either the home market or outside the NBA's campus in Orlando. Hmm. Upon entry into the bubble, guests will have to quarantine and be tested every day for four days. Anyone who tests positive must self-isolate. These cats going to be trying to sneak them in the back door like back when we had uh, visitation restrictions in college. Well, I mean, w- what do you think of the uh, anonymous tip line? There we go. That is the one that's been doing There we go. There we go. That's what I thought we were going to get to, the snitch line. Like, if they had this when Michael Jordan was playing, how much snitching would Michael Jordan be doing in the name of winning at all costs? Anonymous snitching is the top line of snitching. Who's going to be out here? Sti- and by the way, I don't blame these cats for snitching. I'd be snitching on anybody that I could snitch on. Absolutely. I am shook, man. I'm out here looking outside. Y'all stop caring. Y'all stop giving a damn. Y'all just like, if I die, I die, right? Like everybody just out here acting like something changed just because it was summer. 
Nothing changed, okay? Nothing changed. We are not out of the first wave. That thing's still waving hard as hell. If I saw somebody out here breaking these quarantine rules, you damn right I'm snitching. If for no other reason, because I'm hating, right? If I'm staying in here doing what I'm supposed to do, I am going to tell on you. You better believe I'm going to tell on you, whoever it happens to be. Who going to be like the, the number one snitch? I can't wait to find out. What do we find out that Kawhi is a snitch? I wish we could get tapes of those calls. LeBron will snitch. What about... um Palenka? Yeah. Well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let's throw another level. Who's going to be the guy to snitch on somebody on his own team because he just don't like them? Whether or not a player matters to like the will of a championship? Yes. Someone that can be sacrificed? <laughs> Would you snitch on your own teammate to get out of something? Yeah. Self-report. Yo, there was a party over in the uh, yacht club, and uh, it wasn't me. It wasn't me, I promise. It was uh, my two teammates, and they had these girls there. It wasn't me, I promise. Right. That's a good point. Let's think about this, too. So we talked about the card games. Where I said it's going to be some gambling. They're going to need to keep them ATMs in the lobby, like, stocked like a casino. Because these cats going to need the cash to gamble with. You know what I mean? They gonna be up there. By the way, cash. That seems like a great way to catch it. But anyway, they gonna be in there doing all that gambling. The other thing, as many people have heard, they're loosening up the drug restrictions, and they're saying they're not doing no more drug testing. They're doing drug tests for like drugs and for steroids, but they said they're not gonna test for marijuana. The happiest place on earth is gonna be the hippiest place on earth. It's going to be the highest place on earth. You got a bunch of dudes who ain't allowed to do nothing but just sit around with each other and it's personal chefs and they got access to all the food and playing cards and stuff. Woo wee. I like, I don't know how much weed you're going to have to smoke in the hotel for somebody to call on you. They say, um, that you're not allowed to smoke weed at the Disney hotels, but they're not going to test. Let me tell you something about hotels. Hotel looking for any reason whatsoever not to knock on your door about that weed you smoke. If not, from what I've heard, what some of these cats might want to consider is getting a whole bunch of dryer sheets. I myself am not engaged in that activity, but that's what I've been told. I'm just telling you, that's just, you know, that's just who, uh, who's going to be the guy that's really that hater. It's like, I can't believe this dude's next door to me smoking weed because they're going to be smoking a lot of weed. I don't know where they're going to get it from, though. Yeah, because you can't have any guests in there, which means that Rich Paul is not on the invite list. Ah, good point. Let me tell you what, let me tell you what I think they're going to see in that facility. A whole lot of packages being sent from the following places. Oregon, California, perhaps even the District of Columbia. There are some real like survivor type things going on here too, where the last person that's there, you're in this like godforsaken place that you don't want to be, right? Yes. By winning the championship and making it to the finals, how miserable are these people going to be after this tournament, man? Yeah, it'll be the happiest champions ever, right? How? Here's my thing. It'll be the happiest champions ever, but how mad would you be if you lost the finals in game seven? After you got cramped up for three and a half months, only hoping to win a title just to lose. For nothing. For nothing. <laughs> For nothing, for nothing whatsoever. Like if the Bucks get to the finals and lose game seven, by the time all is said and done, Giannis is going to hate all them dudes on the team and all the dudes on the team are going to hate him because they ain't been around nobody but each other for like three and a half months. Did you think it was kind of weird that potential championship contenders are all shacked up at the same place? There's almost like a hierarchy of where these teams are getting set up. That is true. Pelicans are in the yacht club. Grand, whatever, Lakers, Clippers, Raptors, Bucks. Yeah, I guess remember they had to find some way to like recreate like home court advantage. You know what I mean? And so they are rewarding the teams that performed with the nicer accommodations. I tell you this, let me tell you who wasn't about to be staying at no damn yacht club, LeBron James. <laughs> that wasn't about to be it. I also want to see like what players are getting like the presidential suite. All these hotels. Not all the rooms are the same. Yeah, from what I've gathered, too, it's not like some of these accommodations are necessarily the nicest. Yeah, oh, is it? This is going to be a step down. Yeah, yeah, this ain't the Four Seasons now. (laughs) A whole lot of dudes are about to find out just how bougie they have become, right? Who's going to be the first one to order his own towels off of Amazon, right? Like, oh, no, 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 no. I need something a little bit more luxurious than this. All these cats are going to be wearing nothing but team-issued gear. They're going to send the game systems. I imagine that's going to be coming through. 
it's going to be whack. Ain't none of them going to have a good stereo. Well, who's going to be the person that listened to a stereo too loud, right? Up late at night, bumping his music too loud. Like, it's a dorm. You got a family man in one suite? Yes. Well, another thing, too, that's a little weird is, to your point about the dorm environment, a lot of these players, when they're done at work, they go home. That's private right? Yes. They're going back to a time in their lives when very little is private because you're in close yes. quarters with everybody. So imagine all of the different little routines and stuff that people like LeBron do in the privacy and sanctity of their own homes that are going to be on front street now. Yes, 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 yes. And yo, man, let's be honest about this. Everybody needs to know this. All right. These cats live different social lives, shall we say? than the rest of us. Would you like to hear a story? This will give you the best indicator that you need about how different these guys' social lives are, okay? True story. Won't tell you the player, won't tell you the location. But a friend of mine was walking with an NBA All-Star after some, like, charity event or something like that. And he's walking with him, and that All-Star is about to get in a cab and go to his hotel. And as he's about to get in a cab to go to his hotel... These three women pull up in a car and one rolls down the window and says, hey, want to have a foursome? At which point that all-star thought about it, shrugged his shoulders and said, all right, and then went. This was not an exciting thing to find out, right? This was not his lucky day. This is the kind of that comes up all the time in his life. And that dude's going to be stuck in a hotel with a bunch of his partners, perhaps for three months with no visitors. It's going to be a lot of dudes doing push-ups in these hotels. It's going to be a bunch of dudes ripping phone books in half. A bunch. A lot. Because the lives that they live are totally different than the lives that most of us live. Totally different. It's probably been hard enough as it is, but totally, totally, totally different. Those scenarios aren't going to be popping up the same way. I also want to say something right fast because I've seen some people bring this up. I saw somebody mention once on the tweets and they were like, yo, man, well, what's going to happen if people start protesting, you know, at Disney, right? People start showing up to the gates at Disney. Protest. Let me tell you what's going to happen if that happens. Some people are going to suffer very sad fates at the happiest place on earth, right? Now, as you may know, I work for Disney. I don't even think about it that way, just to be clear, but that feels like a full disclosure. This is the only thing that you need to remember about Disney World. And Gabe, I don't know if you know this. Did you know that there is a no-fly zone over Disney? Yes, I am familiar with that. It has long ago been decided that it ain't going to be no ruckus at the happiest place on earth. Right? That call was made a long, long time ago. That ain't happening at the happiest place on earth. Ain't go. That's going to be the safest place on earth. Ain't nobody getting into that bad boy. Nobody at all. It's just going to be a bunch of grumpy NBA players who by the end of this, if it don't work out for you in the league, maybe you can make the Olympic ping pong team, right? Maybe that, maybe that's what some of these cats, like the, the 13th, 14th man, start thinking about your next career. Get your Forrest Gump on. You, you can, you can meet, uh, the president. You can go to, you can go to China. All of that stuff. Just don't bring Daryl Morey with you. They don't like him. All right, it is that time of week where we bring on a guest joining us now. He's doing the Slow Burn podcast with Slate. Last year, we had Joel Anderson on, and Slow Burn was about Biggie and Tupac. This season is about the political rise of David Duke, who I'm sure a few of you have heard of. And joining us now is the host of this season is Josh Levine of Slate. Josh, how are you? I'm good. Thanks for having me. No, man, it is great to have you. So first, why David Duke this season? I grew up in New Orleans. I was born in 1980. And so Duke's political rise in the late 80s and early 90s is a huge thing in my childhood. It's like, I don't have a photographic memory. I'm not that kind of person. But I do still have this strong kind of sense 
memory of that period of the feeling of kind of dread and confusion around Duke of seeing the signs everywhere. And it's been something that's stuck with me for my whole life. And uh, I just have always wanted to go back and try to understand what happened during those years. Well, I also imagine like in that time being from New Orleans and being Jewish, which I think for a lot of us seems like almost a counterintuitive existence. And then a real live like Nazi basically is now running for governor at the time. I imagine that for your life and the people around you, it's like, whoa, wait a minute. What? Yeah. I mean, I think as a white person in America, especially coming up in like a pretty well to do background, you can feel like politics doesn't matter as a kid, you can be like pretty naive about things. And this was a way I think that naivete got stripped away, like understanding that these elections could have serious consequences for the state and the people who live there, including my family. And also just wondering, you know, as a Jewish person in a place where there aren't that many Jewish people just feeling like, do I actually belong here? Is this really my home? Do people here want me to be here? And so, yeah, I mean, all that stuff was kind of in the air. Now, one thing, you know, of course, the name of this is Slow Burn. And I think the thing with Duke that, you know, I'm three episodes into it now. I went ahead and got the uh, Slate Plus uh, subscription so I thank could get you, the third you. episode as quickly as I possibly could. But it's certainly an appropriate title for dealing with Duke because I think that, at least for me, I remember when Duke popped up in the late 80s and early 90s. I'm the same age as you. And it just kind of seems like, oh, my gosh, this Klansman just popped up out of nowhere. But in reality, this had been building basically since he was at LSU in the 70s. Yeah. So he was an egomaniac and he thought he was destined to be president. So just like getting in the runoff for the Louisiana governor's race was kind of a come down for him. But he was running for office as far back as the 1970s when he was a Klansman. And he wanted to build um, a movement around um, white anger. It's something he tried to do in various ways his whole life. And the only difference in the political run in the late 80s was that he, in a disingenuous way, kind of swore off the Klan past, swore off the Nazi sympathies that he'd expressed openly in the 70s and kind of became a more racist Ronald Reagan. And that was a formula for success for him. Now, I think the question for me, at least it seemed in, you know, the way that I took it in hearing it is that it was very interesting that he was kind of overt about, hey, yes, I'm the Klansman. And then Ronald Reagan came around and kind of messed that up for him completely because he looked at Reagan was actually adopting a lot of the things like fundamentally that he was saying but dressed them up much differently and a guy like Duke couldn't survive politically in an era where Reagan had figured out how to code this stuff more elegantly. Yeah, I think that's exactly right and I think Duke used the Klan in some ways it was savvy and in other ways I think it limited him because he recognized that in the 1970s the Klan was, its reputation, deservedly so, was abominable across all demographics in, in America after the atrocities of the 50s and the 60s. And so he recognized that by kind of taking up that mantle and associating himself with the Klan, he would make himself infamous. He would make himself somebody that people would be interested in. It's like, ooh, who is this young guy in a suit who's saying he's a Klansman? We've got to interview this guy. But that also just put a ceiling on his possibilities. You know, the number of people that would go to a Klan rally, you know, even in the most racist parts of the, the country, there, there's a ceiling on that. You're not going to even people who might sympathize with his views and his vision. They're kind of smart enough to know that if you're like a middle class professional, you know, it's probably best not to be seen at an event like that. And so, you know, by the time that Duke recognized that and tried to shift I think he still had this association and this connection that, you know, would make people suspicious of him and rightly so, you know, forever. And correct me if I'm wrong, didn't he kind of sort of like just kind of start up his own chapter of the Klan? Like it wasn't like fully attached to the Klan Klan? Yeah, I mean, it feels a little weird to criticize him and be like, you know, he wasn't a real he wasn't a real authentic Klansman. I mean, <laughs> there is a bite in the show in episode two where he has this debate with Jesse Jackson and Jackson's final kind of kiss off at the end is like, you're not even a legitimate Klansman. Um, <laughs> but Duke starts his own chapter, Knights of the Ku Klux Klan, in 1973. And I think that's a thing that I didn't know until I started researching this. And I think a lot of people don't know is that like when you say that Duke was the 
grand wizard or grand dragon of the KKK. He just made that up. It's not like there was some big vote or like since 18, you know, 67 or whatever, like there was this tradition and it got passed on to him. He just decided like, I'm a Klansman now and I'm going to make myself a leader and people bought it. And I think the, where I find this to be very prescient for right now, and I imagine you correct me if I'm wrong, part of why this story jumps out and seems like a great one to do right now is, what Duke did, we have seen other people pull off recently, which is the idea that if you put a stark raving racist in a suit, the suit makes him respectable. And now all of a sudden he's treated as somebody whose views have to be not even tolerated, but actually consumed as though they are of some measure of dignity. Like we saw this happen with Richard Spencer three or four years ago, where he decided to put himself in a suit. And now all of a sudden he's getting featured in the New York Times. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you could see that in the 70s when Duke was actually in the Klan, where, you know, his first national um, platform was on The Tomorrow Show with Tom Snyder in 1974, when Duke was still at LSU. And this was a show that um, was like on at 1 a.m. on the East Coast and really wanted to be edgy. They're booking guests who they think will get attention. And so, yeah, it's like Klansmen in a suit. Let's give him a plane ticket to, you know, to, to come out to, to our set and we'll uh, have him on. And that gives Duke a platform of, you know, an audience of three million people to air his views. But I think you also saw it in the late 80s and, and early 90s. You know, he was not only wearing a suit when he was out campaigning in Louisiana, but when he wins the state rep race in the all white New Orleans suburbs, he actually not only does he have the suit then, he has a platform of being an elected official. And so then, you know, based on uh, the norms of our media, when somebody's a a politician, then you kind of treat them in a, in a certain way. You put the like Republican Louisiana in parentheses behind their name. They ha- it conferred a kind of legitimacy on him that um, you know, gave him the standing that he needed to run for higher office. And I feel like it put him in a place. I always say that one thing that's important to understand about race in the public discourse is that largely among white people, race is a discussion that they have between each other, right? Like black people are kind of a topic of discussion, but it's really about them, right? It's this group of people versus this group of white people versus this group of white people. And one thing I noticed, I think it was in episode two, something that Duke kind of weaponized was the idea of saying out loud to people who were more left leaning than him, basically, oh, you don't like them any more than we do, right? Like, you don't want to live with them any more than we do. And so it seems like his campaign, again, was less about any, like, specific policy, political notion as much as just really I'm tapping into whiteness. For sure. And the guy that he ran against in 89 that he beat um, was John Treen, who had been in the segregationist states' rights party back in the day. And what Duke said was, and I think this was really powerful for the people that voted for him, like, this guy doesn't believe anything any different than I do. You know, him saying that he has changed his stripes, that's no no different than what I'm saying. The only difference is that I'm being honest with you about what I believe, whereas this guy is saying the same things that I'm saying behind closed doors. And so Duke was trying to make an argument about authenticity and that I'm being real and all these other people are fake. And I think he tried to normalize racism in that way. Like, like, come on, white people, we all are talking about all this stuff. Like, I'm just, you know, the the one who's open about it and admits it. And I think for people who were openly racist, or people who maybe were kind of inching in that direction, I think he, he made them feel safe and comfortable in their viewpoints. And I think he started with this message that he thought would work, but you know, you need affirmation whenever you basically he's no uh, politicians are no different than people who like create content or whatever, right? Like you think you've got a good idea, but you have some moment that turns it over. You're like, Oh man, I think this thing is really catching on. And I found it interesting that for Duke, it was a trip to Boston. Yeah. So he goes to Boston in 1974 as the busing crisis is really getting underway. Um, you know, the first day of school in Boston. Uh, South Boston, September 1974, there's, you know, white adults and children engage in mob violence against black students who are being bused there and integrating the schools. And Duke, sensing, you know, racial conflict, he's like, I'm going to be on the next plane from Baton Rouge. He goes up there 
and says the people in South Boston are American heroes. This is the new American revolution. You know, the government is forcing this integration and integration is bad. We should be separate. And the reception that he gets there, he doesn't get any kind of attention from the media, doesn't get attention from public officials. But there is this kind of grassroots response to him in South Boston that just like, again, this guy is saying what we believe. And they're kind of like egging each other on and the crowd, egging Dukan to say racial slurs, um, him standing up on a car and proclaiming white victory. I mean, it's a it's a kind of terrifying scene to think about. And I also wonder with him, and this wasn't really so explicitly stated, but it's something that I talk about all the time, which is I always say that any state in America, if you make it 40 percent black, it'll start looking like Mississippi real fast. Right. Like that is kind of the driving factor in this. And people have this assumption about the South as being kind of uh, South, the South as more racist than other places in the country. When I think in reality, the South just has a different threat because of the demographics and the population numbers. But I always wonder with Duke, for him to get out of the South and realize that it was resonating in that same way. That had to be the moment that just unlocked something for him. I think that's right. And I think in the late 80s, there was this debate about whether Duke was a creature of Louisiana or whether this could happen anywhere. The novelist Walker Percy actually had a good quote about this um, in an interview, and I think it was June 1989, where he said, you know, the people outside Louisiana like to think we're all like rednecks and yahoos down here, but this could happen in Chicago. This could happen in Queens. And I think that, you know, people like to look down on, you know, whether it's Louisiana or Mississippi, and rightly so in a lot of ways. But it's no accident that, you know, there are lots of examples of, you know, like Martin Luther King going to Chicago and saying he never witnessed more resistance than he did when, um, you know, marching for housing there. Or, you know, what saw in Boston during the, the busing crisis. And, and Duke was received very, very well there. Yeah, like that was, and, and I try to be careful about this because Boston is so easy to pick on, right? Like Boston sure. is the Mississippi of the North. Like when it's time to talk about somebody being racist, we just throw it out to Boston. But that scene that you described in Boston was like, oh my goodness, what's really going on? Well, even the Red Sox now are saying that Boston is racist. So I think it's gotten, uh, gotten, affirma- <laughs> gotten affirmation from the highest levels of Massachusetts royalty. Yeah, they didn't trust it when the spotlight team said it, right? <laughs> like I was, I was so amazed that the spotlight team was like, "Fine, guys, we'll look into this and see what we can come back with." And they came back with everything everybody has been saying about us is correct. Yeah, I saw that you tweeted out, uh, Bamani, just uh, about some of the the stats from uh, the ninety Senate race and the ninety one governor's race, and the thing that's so interesting to me conceptually and how to just looking back and thinking about how to feel about the Duke phenomenon. So in 90, when he loses on um, that Senate race, he had 44% of the vote, gets 60% of the white vote in Louisiana. And the governor's race, he loses in a landslide to Edwin Edwards, but 55% of the white vote. How do you think about those numbers? I think about those numbers. And I mean, it's worth noting, Trump got the majority of white voters of every demographic in America basically, right, at every turn. Now, part of that's in line with the fact that Republicans get the majority of white votes in just about every election that you wind up having. But 60 percent of the white vote in Louisiana was kind of staggering when you looked at it. Now, of course, part of Southern voting behavior just basically has to do with white people voting against integration, right? Like it's a long continued history of like for black populations in the South to be as large as they are and those states to still be red means all the white people are voting in the same direction. So as disturbing as kind as it is, the idea that David Duke could win 55 percent of the white vote in one of those elections. It's also kind of interesting that 45 percent of people were just like, oh, hold on now. This is just a little just a little too far. And I wonder from those people is was that a rejection fully of his views or did they find him to be embarrassing? Because one thing Southerners are very concerned about is how they look relative to everybody else on these kinds of things. In the governor's race, there was definitely some of the latter. And, a, and an appeal that was really effective was from the business community that said, it's going to be catastrophic. Like, we're going to lose convention business in New Orleans. We're going to lose tourism. You had people like Bobby Bear the Saints quarterback then cutting an ad, not calling out Duke specifically, but saying, you know, there's some cheesy line in there about like, you know, 
the black and gold and black and white need to come together to stop racism. And, and there was this consensus among sort of elite business leaders in the state that like we need to come out really strongly against this guy. So I don't know if that particular economic argument worked or it was the embarrassment thing, but I think it wasn't all necessarily just a repudiation of his views. There was some kind of calculation there of this is what the effect's going to be. This is how it's going to make us look. I wonder how it would have gone if he won, right? Because I think that there were a lot of people who felt very similarly um, about Trump. And I'm not making a direct parallel between those two guys before somebody said, but money said Trump and the Klan. No, I'm not saying that directly, right? They obviously have some views that are in line the same way. But I think there were people who were embarrassed by the idea of Trump. And then he won and everybody fell in line. Like if Duke had won that, I really wonder how the people within his party would have then behaved. Well, we saw a little bit of that when he won in 1989, and you had the National Republican Party led by uh, Lee Atwater, who notorious for his cynicism around race. But in this case, as he was, again, calculating, but immediately, you know, he called it excommunicating Duke from the National Republican Party. They thought Duke of an embarrassment, that he was somebody who would make the Republican Party look like it was explicitly racist in a way that they didn't want to appear. Whereas in Louisiana, it was more complicated. There were some Republicans in the state who denounced him, but there were others who, while not explicitly saying, you know, we support this guy, were also very careful about not alienating his voters because Duke was this runaway train and the people that would vote for Duke, you know, these were potentially new voters that were being brought into the Republican base as part of this realignment from the old Dixiecrat South to the new solidly Republican South. And so there was a lot of very cynical calculation of like, we don't like what this guy stands for, or maybe we do like what this guy stands for. We don't want to say it, admit it out loud. Well, it kind of pointed to something that I had kind of thought about, which is I think, you know, we'd agree basically the reconfiguration of the two major parties in America happens in 1964. Since 1964, the Republicans have not elected what I would consider to be a real live Southerner to the presidency. Like George W. Bush doesn't really count, right? He was the governor of Texas and he had enough of a twang, but this is still, I mean, he's not much more Southern than his daddy was and none of us think of him in that way. And by the same token, Obama being the exception, The Democrats have basically just elected Southerners to presidency from 1964 on. It kind of speaks to the consensus model of American politics where you've got these two parties. And that's kind of the convergence to the median for a lot of people that you can get somebody. If you're a Democrat, you can get somebody that's fairly liberal, but you kind of need somebody Southern in order to sell those people. And if you're a Republican, we can't have somebody that looks too much like the worst of what people associate with us. And so I can find it very it, it totally makes sense that the George W. Bushes of the world and even Lee Atwater, who was cynical about race, but also like playing blues guitar and tried to get himself on the board at Howard because he somehow thought he could do both things at one time. That's not the guy that's looking at David Duke like, yeah, there's the future right there. Like, I think they seem to feel like the future of the party had to separate itself from such a guy. And then interestingly, you wind up with Trump, who again says very similar things to a guy like Duke, but the packaging, even as bombastic as he is, is different than you get from a dude like Duke. Yeah, totally. I'm glad you brought up Lee Atwater being on the board of Howard because sometimes, you know, when you're doing interviews like this, people ask, like, what's the craziest thing you learned? And, like, there's not really any place to put that in a podcast about David Duke, but I had not known that Lee Atwater was on the board of Howard. It's just an amazing moment in the history of this country (laughs) that some set of people thought that this was a good idea. Yeah, until it wasn't. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know if you've ever seen the clip of when he showed up on campus. Like, if, for people who haven't seen it, it's a great documentary on Atwater called Boogeyman. That's worth checking out. And what was fascinating about that with Atwater is Atwater shows up on campus and the students are out in full-throated protest and it broke his heart because to him, he just thought this other stuff was politics, right? He's like, man, I'll be out here playing the blues. I hang out with black people, all this stuff. He just thought it was politics. And we were like, no, actually, that's not what it is at all. Like, he was so proud to be on that board. And they're like, nah, buddy, (laughs) you got to go. Yeah. But back to the Republican Democrat thing you were talking about a a few minutes ago. Um, I think a thing that's important to note is that in all of these races that we've been talking about, there were other Republicans on the ballot. So it wasn't like white people in the state were like, oh, we could vote for this Democrat who we don't like, or David Duke is the only Republican choice. Like in all of these races, there were other Republican options. And so Duke became the top 
Republican choice in all of these races, not because the party picked him, not because he won some convention. It was because the voters marked their ballots for him. They wanted him. Now, I maybe should have started earlier with this, but I think that this is very important for people who are not very familiar with the South in general, but not familiar with Louisiana in particular. This is an insane political system that we are talking about in the state of Louisiana. And I don't even know if insane is the right word, but unique definitely fits, right? Like how much of the story of Duke and his rise is particular to Louisiana? Well, there is this open primary system where um, there's no Republican and Democratic primary. So everybody kind of um, runs at the same time. Now, that's the jungle primary system, as some people call it. Yeah. You know, you only have to think about this for about three seconds to understand that what ends up happening inevitably in the system is that people from the extremes get favored and people in the middle kind of tend to get squeezed out. And so it's a system that definitely was beneficial to Duke. It's a system that Edwin Edwards actually conceived of and and pushed through in the 70s when there were essentially no statewide Republicans in, in statewide office. And Edwards was annoyed at always having to face some like lame Republican challenger after like making it through the Democratic primary. And so he's like, oh, it'll be more efficient. I can just beat them all <laughs> at once, not kind of understanding that he was actually empowering the Republican Party and making the Republican Party stronger. And so, yeah, it's the voting system, I think, did help him. It is particular to Louisiana. But as far as the electorate goes, then I think you could probably find similarities in a, in a bunch of other states. Now, you brought up a man, Edwin Edwards, and I'm sure we'll get more to him. That race for governor, I need to find out who ran Edwin's campaign because it involves some of the most hilarious campaign propaganda and paraphernalia that you will ever find, including the bumper stickers that said, vote for the crook. It's important. We will get uh, in the in the podcast later episode to where vote for the crook came from, but we're still working on it on the remaining episodes. But you brought it up. But every person that we interview, no matter what we're talking to them about, no matter who they are, what kind of aspect of all of this they're involved in, has said, you remember that slogan from 1991, vote for the crook, it's important. It is one of the (laughs) most memorable and effective and evocative slogans, I think, in American political history. Well, I mean, have there been two people to run against each other who were more self-aware about what exactly it was that they were doing? Uh, I th- I think it would be hard to find another twosome like them. I mean, they were both really into gambling. Edwards, you know, known for his one-liners, talked about how they were both wizards uh, underneath the sheets. So, you know, there are a lot of differences some maybe superficial similarities, but it's, I think, easy to understand if you can think back, like, why the runoff between them in November 1991 would become this huge national story and international and national media would descend on Louisiana. Because you not only have the possibility of the Klan guy becoming governor of Louisiana, you also just have Edwards as one of the most memorable characters in American politics. Now, in your research, what do you think is probably like, the most surprising thing that you stumbled upon? Other than Lee Atwater at, uh, at Howard. <laughs> yes. I guess I wasn't as aware of the connections between Duke and Nazism. And it probably wouldn't be a surprise, but I think it's still interesting to note that, you know, what polling found is that connecting Duke with the Klan was not like a real winning issue for Duke's opponents. Because if you're asking uh, white voters to say, like, you can't vote for somebody who's in the Klan, you're saying, like, are you asking me to disavow my father? Are you asking me to disavow my uncle? I mean, like, there's a lot of connections to the Klan for a lot of people. But the Nazi stuff was seen as beyond the pale. Um, And so Duke, you know, somebody who was an inveterate fabulist, would try to pretend like, you know, he hadn't worn a swastika, that he hadn't been um, associated with and connected to the American Nazi Party. And, you know, I didn't know a thing that I learned from Eli Saslow's book, which is that the first time that Duke went 
to a convention, like a Nazi conference, basically, in Virginia, the people that the Nazi group connected him with for a carpool were Don Black, who would later found Stormfront, the biggest racist website um, in America, and this guy, Joseph Paul Franklin, who would become a serial killer, who shot and killed interracial couples, who shot Larry Flint, who shot Vernon Jordan. And so these connections and how many of them there were and, you know, contrasting that with Duke's later, like, disavowals, that was something that was pretty stark to me. Well, how complicit is the media in this? And I say that because, you know, the media has had this dilemma about what to do with Donald Trump when he says things that are not true or says things that are irresponsible, you know, whether or not you should put them on television or broadcast them simply because he's the president of the United States. And it sounds like a lot of people were just putting David Duke on TV, like you said, because it was a Klansman in a suit without thinking a little deeper about that. Yeah, I think that Tom Snyder is a really good example of the arrogance of a lot of media around these issues, because I think there can be a conflation where people think that, oh, because somebody's views are so wrong and so evil, that means that we can beat them in a debate. When that person's been thinking about this stuff and preparing for their entire life, and maybe you, as Tom Snyder, like the day before you interviewed, um, you know, I I mentioned that like one guest he had on was like a blind man who is a pon- pornography censor. I mean, like mm-hmm. this guy was not prepared to deal with David Duke. And so I, I think a lesson there is that if you choose to give somebody like this a platform, you need to know what you're doing. You need to understand the gravity of that and you need to be prepared. And I think there are some instances of, of media who were prepared for Duke um, and who treated him a lot differently than than Snyder did. Um, and so I, I think he was a creation of the media, certainly in the 70s. And I think it's a harder question, the debates that emerged in the late 80s and early 90s about like, if we cover this guy, are we giving him oxygen? Or is he just a really big threat? And it would be irresponsible of us not to dig in on him and, and do a lot of reporting. All right, all right, fast. I almost missed this. We have some audio um, from this and a bit of a sports tie-in. Uh, this is Collis Temple Jr., who is his son, Garrett Temple, plays in the NBA, plays for the Nets. But uh, he was the first black player at LSU in basketball, which did not happen until 1971. That was surprising for me to find out um, in looking it up. And so I wanted you guys to hear Collis Temple Jr. talking about his David Duke experience. Collis was 17 years old when he moved into the athlete's dormitory. He lived with more than a hundred young white men. There were tense times when I was around these guys because they weren't feeling comfortable with me. And I knew that the majority of the guys weren't necessarily interested in me being there. Some of my social outlet, candidly, in terms of who I communicated with the most, were actually people who cleaned up the dorm that I lived in, the janitors. And the people who cooked. Temple also spent time hanging out with other black undergrads at LSU's student union. To get there, he had to walk past a campus hotspot. Free speech alley was just a, an identifiable area where people just got up and expressed how they felt. And people talked about some of everything, all the social ills throughout this country. Students at Free Speech Alley spouted off about the dress code at LSU, which forbade women from wearing pants. They got fired up about President Nixon in the Vietnam War, and they argued about civil rights. There was one student, David Duke, who was always shouting about the dangers of integration. He'd be out there talking about why Jews and should not be a part of our society. That's basically what it came down to and he stop and listen i stop and listen and i yell and tell him he was full of yeah that's a lot yeah and i was really glad to be able to feature carl's temple jr who's a really incredible guy and somebody whose life story and his story at lsu kind of exposes just by juxtaposition you know the absurdity of duke's claim that it was white people who are the ones who are really being discriminated against when you look at them next to each other you can see how absurd that is 
All right. Now, last thing I want to ask you while we got you, and I'm going, this is going to be very difficult to do. I understand, but I want you to give it the old college try. Can you try to describe our man, Harry Lee in one sentence? <laughs> I'll give you two. Very powerful Chinese American sheriff who claimed he couldn't be racist because he was Chinese. A right wing sheriff. And by the way, leans in on the notion of the sheriff is the most powerful man anywhere that there is. Like I had never heard anybody talk about himself being law and order in the way that Harry Lee talked about it here. A guy who financed a Mardi Gras float that had uh, the design was his own face and would go on the float every Mardi Gras and throw dolls of himself to the adoring crowd. <laughs> so somebody with no shortage of ego, but who in these New Orleans suburbs where that, you know, Duke's base was, was a guy who kind of enforced this idea of, you know, I'm going to make this place comfortable and safe for white people. I mean, he was a very important figure to understanding that environment. I listen to podcasts typically on one and a half speed, and I got to go back and listen to that episode because I need to hear that man talk. Like you, you, you put all of those things together. I need to hear that man talk. Yeah. One of many fascinating figures in slow burn season four. <laughs> right. So you guys are still working on the project. It's great so far, right? So I guess we're going to, how far into Duke's journey are you going to go with the last three episodes? So I'm going to go through the governor's race in 91. And I think it's, you know, my preference with projects like these and with the first three seasons, of slow burn is to really inhabit that particular period of time and not really carry it forward into what's happening now, just because I think one of the kind of central precepts of, of the show is that we don't know how stuff is going to end up when we're living through it. We don't know what the consequences are going to be. And I think, you know, I find it more powerful just as a, a listener or as a reader if you're trusting the audience to kind of draw the lines and make the connections themselves rather than me coming on at that and being like, huh, look at what's happening now, you know, like, uh, can you see it? This is my man, Josh Levine. Check out Slow Burn. If this season is on David Duke and his political career. Please check that out. I'm three episodes in. Check it out. It's Slate. I am loving every bit of it, man. And thank you so much for joining us here. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Bomani. I appreciate it. All right, no problem. And ladies and gentlemen, thanks so much for joining us here on The Right Time. We do this thing a couple times a week. My man Gabe Bassane handles everything behind the scenes. Thank you, sir. Uh, remember, subscribe to The Right Time. Rate us, review us, give us five stars. You only give us four stars. I'm inclined to believe you are a hater. And we'll talk to you guys in a couple of days. Take it easy. Thanks for checking out The Right Time with Bomani Jones Podcast. You can listen or subscribe on the ESPN app. Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to podcasts. The Right Time with Bomani Jones.